Hello, welcome to Talking Europe, although this time we have slightly stretched the definition of Europe. We've brought you to Georgia, a small country sandwiched between the giants of Russia and Turkey, with increasingly close links to Europe, but a very strong history, culture and identity all of its own. This Caucasus nation's population of around 4 million people write and speak a language that's completely unique. They have a winemaking tradition that goes back 8,000 years. Even the statues are drinking it and it's got special UNESCO status. In this programme, we're going to be looking at what makes the Georgia of today, 100 years on from its founding as an independent nation. We're also going to be looking into how Europe plays into its present and its future. First, a little recent history. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Georgia regained its independence. Since then, however, two regions have broken away and declared autonomy with Russia's recognition, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, where full-blown military hostilities broke out in 2008. In 2014, Georgia made a new turn towards Europe, signing an association agreement that has since made the EU Georgia's biggest trading partner. The European Union now provides more than 100 million euros of funding each year to Georgia for reforms in public administration, justice and the focus of this programme, agriculture. We met our first... last four years, the EU has invested more than 70 million euros in rural communities here in Georgia. From winemaking to honey, our reporter Luke Brown has been to meet some of the people involved in EU-supported projects. Mikhail Chankotadze is an unlikely figure of change in Georgian farming. Trained as an historian, he returned to his family farm and planted over 3,000 walnut trees. The state helped pay for the seeds and a new irrigation system. This is the drip irrigation system. Water is delivered directly to the plant, so there's less wastage of the water resource. Mikhail honed his knowledge at a European Union-funded training centre. Now his farm is used as a model for other locals, hoping to get a start in farming. They're interested in what we're doing, on how we're spending our money, how we work, how we use our energy. We've had a lot of people come who were interested. They want to do the same as us, follow our example. The EU has funded 59 training centres around Georgia, reaching over a quarter of a million locals. Agriculture in Georgia employs over half of the workforce. Accessing European expertise is vital to improving productivity. Our best farmers are sent to Europe and they learn about new techniques there. Then they help us incorporate what they learned in our region and the government program. From 2013 to 2022, the EU is investing 180 million euros in Georgian agriculture and rural development, providing know-how as well as improved equipment. Gogita Makaridze runs a wine cooperative that has received 38,000 euros. This Tajola co-op now mixes traditional Georgian techniques with modern European-funded machinery. We used to crush the grapes with our weight, but as you can see, I don't have much of that. So we got this machine which helps us make white wine using European techniques. Winemaking has been in the Makaridze family for generations. In all over 280 Georgian cooperatives like this have received direct EU funding. Here they only produce 5,000 litres a year, typical of Georgia's fragmented farming sector. Cultivating these small plots of land is not easy. European financial aid is vital. The EU programs are good for small farmers who are handicapped by not having the right equipment. We've received EU aid since 2014, and we can see the results from that. The government here has also seen what we've achieved thanks to the aid, that we've become bigger and more productive. Europe is both a source of funding and an appetizing market. The Tapli Sascino Honey Cooperative has received 90,000 euros for machinery. That's helped them improve the quality of the honey and quadruple production to 20 tonnes a year. If you don't have the know-how, the resources, equipment, you'll never be more than a small farmer and you'll struggle to create wealth. We've managed this thanks to the EU support, as well as our hard work and determination. 
The cooperative is looking beyond the local market. They hope to export their honey and meeting European standards is the key next stage. Thanks to the EU aid, we feel that we will in future be a member of the big EU family. We see the development in the EU, and that makes us more determined to achieve the same here. Most Georgian honey doesn't yet reach European standards. With that in mind, the co-op is aiming its sights, for now, on the Asian market. We're now about an hour outside of Tbilisi in, as you can see, a very rural area. Now, around 40% of Georgians actually live in rural communities. This is an area where the European Union is particularly interested in investing. There's a 10-year project currently underway with a 180 million euro budget. This is a small plantation growing herbs for herbal teas. It's had some European support. We're going to go and meet the lady who makes those teas. And here is Natalia Pads Khaladze of Kona Tea. Hi, Natalia. Hi, Katrina. Uh, I can see you're drying herbs. Which ones today? Uh, the pomegranate flower comes from the neighboring village. This is uh, uh, calendula from our garden, uh, cornflower, uh, melissa. And I know you had European support. What kind of help? My budget was 7,000 euros and this was enough to, to make work census enterprise and a drip irrigation system out there in the garden. There's a new European free trade agreement with Georgia as well. Has that benefited you? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, within five years, I hope to, uh, to, to be in France, in, in Germany, in Europe, on the European market. Okay, maybe we'll go and taste some of your tea. Yes, of course. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, I'm going to do for you the love tea, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, which is a mix of black tea, uh, rose petals, rhododendron flower, which is uh, the endemic flower of the greater Caucasus, uh, a bit of peppers and cocoa nibs. And it's going to make the, the um, gourmet mix and then goes to, to this muslin cotton bag with this rose instead oh, of the tech. Oh, that's very beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, we're going to taste the tea and find out more about the wider project uh, supporting agriculture in Georgia. I'm in very good company with Christina Casella from the delegation of the European Union to Georgia. Hello, thanks for being with us. Hello. First question, why should it be the European Union that gives money to Georgian farmers rather than perhaps a bank loan? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a really good question because um, we have to say, first of all, that the Georgian farmers are usually very small farmers. They don't have that much access to resources and they have a very very hard time trying to access a loan from the bank. The banks are very reluctant to give out these bank loans so it is true that they often turn uh, themselves either to programs from the government or to outside assistance and um, for us the development of agriculture is seen as really a priority in Georgia because it is one of the key drivers of economic development in the country and also can very much contribute to the, de um, the diminishing of the uh, poverty in the country. And it's not just about money, is it? No, not at all. Through these information and consultation services, I think that we have touched about 250,000 people. Now, it is a lot of money that the European Union's putting in over 10 years. Uh, are there concerns about where the money's going? There are known issues with corruption in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, European projects are very much monitored very closely. And um, for example, for this component that we were talking about with the cooperatives, um, it is we rely on some very trusted NGOs to um, implement these on the ground. And then these NGOs report back to us and they have to report back on every cent that was spent. So uh, we are not too worried about that with regards to these projects. 
talking about cooperatives, that's a concept that has some difficult connotations in Georgia, I understand. Indeed, yes. Um, during Soviet times, there was uh, forced collecting, collective farming, uh, which of course left a lot of negative memories in the minds of people. It was not at all what a modern and free cooperative should be. But unfortunately, the idea of working with others and cooperatively um, was really seen negatively. And when we came in with the idea of a modern cooperative and European style cooperative, uh, we had a lot of um, work to do to try and break this uh, prejudice and uh, to try and get people to see that this is really not uh, the same type of cooperative and that through cooperation there are very tangible benefits for the farmers, first of all in terms of their access to markets and to raising their incomes. The programme you work for, it's got a duration of 10 years. That finishes in 2022. Uh, what are you hoping for for the future? First and foremost, I think I would be very happy to see a decrease in the rural poverty. I would like to see more revitalised um, rural areas where the standards of living are higher and where people are, are able to make a living through agriculture or other um, means. Well, thank you very much, Christina. Let's uh, perhaps taste our tea. I think it's ready now. And while we drink our tea, uh, you can watch this report from Morocco, another one of the European Union's neighbourhood countries, also benefiting uh, from help with its agricultural development. This report from Jean-Marie Le Maire.